Hello, I'm Dr. Mikey Muborn, and this is Systematic Theology One. Today we're looking at the topic, the Trinity. What a great topic for us to study. It's so important because there's been a lot of things taught about the Trinity over the years. Many of them are false, but also there are so many truths that we see coming out even from the early church fathers. You've probably heard the Trinity explained in several different ways because there's a lot of analogies out there. You might have heard the egg analogy or the water analogy. Maybe somebody is a father, a son, or a, and a husband type of analogy before, three-leaf clo clover. Um, but there's all types of analogies but all of them fall short of really what the Trinity is all about. So we're going to look at that today. It's so good to be with you. Let's begin our study. Hello and welcome to Systematic Theology One. Today we're looking at the Trinity. This is a wonderful topic and it's good to be with you. Let's begin our study. I want to start by looking at the early church fathers. The early church fathers worked diligently to explain the Trinity and this is what they decided. It's three persons and yet it's one God. Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, each possessing all divine attributes, but they have different functions. Every attribute related to God the Father is equally related to the Son and the Holy Spirit. Only in their personal properties and functions can a person truly distinguish the persons of the Trinity. And I think this is important. When they were working on this early on in the uh, second, third, even fourth century, they were trying to understand how do we speak of uh, the three persons in one. And so that's where we started to see the first idea of the word Trinity. We see that on our next slide here. Earliest references to the doctrine of the Trinity. And we see that with our early church fathers. The doctrine of the Trinity is not a truth of natural theology, but of revelation. Reason may show us the unity of God. But the doctrine of the Trinity comes from direct revelation. Though the term Trinity does not occur in the Bible, it had very early usage in the church. Thiessen had said that. Its Greek form, trios, um, seems to have been the first used by Theophilus of Antioch. He also used the phrase triad as well. And its Latin form of Trinitas by Tertullian, and that is in A.D. 220. And so you see these different forms because people didn't know how to refer to it, especially when we look at the beginning of the Bible in Genesis chapter 1. Who are we talking about when the Bible says in Genesis 126, let us make man in our image? Who's the us here and what's the focus there? Or what are we talking about when we explain Jesus' baptism and we see the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is present in that moment? We clearly see the three persons uh, but how do we define that? And so that's what they work diligently trying to do. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. The unity of God. The unity of God means that there is but one God and that the divine nature is undivided and indivisible. There is one God is the great truth of the Old Testament. And you see that. The same truth is frequently taught in the New Testament about being one God, and you see for some passages there. But God is not merely one. He is the only God. As such, He is unique, and you see that in some other passages there as well. Also, we see the divine nature is undivided and indivisible with Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Mark 12, 29, Jesus answered, The most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. What's so unique about this passage is that it's a quote of Deuteronomy chapter 6, and the question has come, um, what is the greatest commandment, or what are the greatest commandments? And Jesus begins by saying this from Deuteronomy chapter 6, and he says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind and strength, love your neighbor as yourself. Um, then in James 2.19, you see this again. You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Meaning that's orthodoxy, to believe that God is one. And I think it's worth noting that the demons understand that. God has taught that, and it's important for everybody to understand that. God does not consist of parts, nor can he be divided into parts. He is one, and that's what Henry Thiessen makes very clear throughout his lectures in systematic theology. 
Now, understanding the Trinity, we see this from John Piper, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are distinct persons. The Bible speaks of the Father as God in Philippians 1-2, Jesus is God, Titus 2-13, and the Holy Spirit is God in Acts chapter 5. Are these just three different ways of looking at God or simply ways of referring to three different roles that God plays? Well, we clearly see this throughout the Scripture. God is saying this is one God but made up in the three persons. And so we don't worship three persons. We worship one God, but our one but our one God, our one Lord, is made up in three persons. Each person is fully God. If God is three persons, does this mean that each person is one-third of God? Does the Trinity mean that God is divided into three parts? Of course not. Um, the Bible makes it abundantly clear that they are all equal in our uh, in their power and in their property and all those types of things, but there may be some differences in their manifestations or their functions, and so those are very important. The divine essence is not something that is divided between the three persons, but is fully in all three persons without being divided into parts. That's what John Piper had to say about that, and I think that's a wonderful answer to that. Understand the Trinity. He also wrote, the fact that the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are distinct persons means, in other words, that the Father is not the Son, the Son is not the, Fa the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is not the Father. Jesus is God, but He is not the Father or the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God, but He is not the Son or the Father. They are different persons, not three different ways of looking at at God. And sometimes this is difficult to understand because um, they are different. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are different in who they are. Um, it's not three separate gods. It's one God in three persons. I think this is a decent illustration. Of course, all illustrations fall short of what they should be when we're talking about the Trinity. But I think this is somewhat helpful. You see here, the Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is not the Father. But the Father is God. The Son is God. The Holy Spirit is God. So they're all God made up of three persons. And I think that's helpful, even though we may not be able to wrap our minds around it or fully comprehend it. Um, it's clear throughout the Word of God that this is what we're looking at or something similar to, uh, to this. Okay, References to the Trinity. Instances when the Bible speaks of the Trinity, the baptism of Jesus, the Spirit descended on him, and a voice from God, uh, and a voice from God out of heaven identified Jesus as the beloved Son. We know that in Matthew chapter 3, verse 16. Jesus prayed that the Father would send another comforter. Think about that. Jesus on earth praying to the Father that he would send another comforter who is the Spirit of Christ. And then the disciples were told to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Isn't that interesting when you think about that? Why, why is God instructing us to baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit? Because there are three persons, yet one God, as he's made clear. Now, there are a lot of heresies when it comes to the Trinity. And I want to give you a few of those, and I, I think these are helpful. Modalism is one of them. Modalism teaches that the Trinity is not three distinct, distinct persons, but just different modes that God reveals himself to human beings. So under modalism, God acts as the Father in the Old Testament, the Son in the Gospels, and the Spirit in the Acts and the Epistles. Modalism teaches that one God just changes forms or modes over the course of Scripture. So you might see it this way, and I, I say it's kind of twisted and it's kind of spins, um, and that's why it's doing that. But one God in three, what? No persons, but modes of being, and that's the teaching of modalism. All right? Uh, another one is Arianism. Arianism is named after the heretic Arius. Her uh, Arius was condemned by the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. He taught that the Son was at one point created by God the Father, his motto was that there was a time when the Son did not exist. Jesus then becomes a created being and thus less than fully God. And so kind of here's a picture 
of the uh, Council of Nicaea here dealing with these types of things and and shutting people out because of their wrong beliefs, those that type of thing. Okay, and then another one is tritheism. Few, if any, have ever tried to teach this heresy or tritheism, but it needs to be mentioned anyways. Tritheism denies the unity of the Godhead by saying there is just three different gods. Tritheism denies that there is only one God, and so kind of a picture of it that's twisted here. Uh, tritheism is there's the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. They are separate, um, separate three gods there, all right? And then we know that there are many analogies that people use to explain the Trinity. But these analogies fall short, once again, of explaining something that's so deep. But you might be familiar with some of these analogies, and I think they're worth mentioning. Insufficient analogies about the Trinity. Number one, the egg. There's three different parts of the egg, but there's one egg. Now, you know that. Um, also, water. Water can be in different forms, yet it's still water. So it can be in a, a liquid, a gas, or a solid, depending on what we're talking about here. If we're talking about steam, or if we're talking about actual water as a liquid, or we're talking about ice, and it can be a solid. Three-leaf clover is another example of an analogy that's given. Father, husband, and son, they're all, they all can be the same person, yet they have these different different functions. And then student, son, and brother is very similar to that. And the newest one that's out is three persons, one God with a fidget spinner. And um, if you know what these are, it's just little toys people, uh, a lot of kids like to have or play with and kind of keeps them focused or whatever it might be. But just, uh, just kind of another idea, right? The wheel, and the middle helps, and there's three wheels on the outside, and it all spins together, and those types of things. So, um, people are always trying to explain the Trinity, but it's the Trinity can't really be explainable in these ways, not by analogies. The Trinity is very unique in every way, and so it's important that we know what the Bible says about the Trinity. False views about the Trinity, Christian science. Um, believes the Trinity is life, truth, and love. You see that in science and health. Also, the traditional doctrine of the Trinity is more or less polytheism or belief in multiple gods. This is more like tritheism, if you want to look at it that way. Islam. Islam says that the Trinity is shirk, an unforgivable sin that associates partners with God. It states that the Trinity is the Father, the Son, and Mary. Jehovah's Witnesses um, deny the Trinity and accuse it of being unbiblical and pagan. Church of Latter-day Saints, the Trinity is three separate gods. So there's another picture there of that belief. Um, but when we're thinking about the Trinity, let's look at the summary that's given to us. I think John Piper does a great job with this. The Trinity is not belief in three gods. There is only one God, and we must never stray from this. This one God exists as three persons. The three persons are not each part of God, but are each fully God and equally God. Within God's one undivided being, there is an unfolding into three interpersonal relationships such that there are three persons. The distinctions within the Godhead are not distinct distinctions of his essence, or neither are they something added on to his essence, but they are the unfolding of God's one undivided being into three interpersonal relationships such that there are three real persons. He goes on to say, God is not one person who took three consecutive roles. That is the heresy of modalism. The Father did not become the Son and then the Holy Spirit. Instead, there have always been and always will be three distinct persons in the Godhead. Then the Trinity is not a contradiction because God is not three in the same way that he is one. God is one in essence, three in person. And that pretty much sums up what the Trinity is all about. So I hope this is very helpful for you, uh, giving us the doctrines about the Trinity. Even though the word Trinity is not a biblical word per se, it is very important to know that there's a doctrine of the Trinity that, that helps us understand 
who God is in three persons yet in one God. All right. It's good to be with you today. God bless you. Hope you have a great, great rest of the day. Bye-bye. All right. That concludes our study about the Trinity. It's been so good to be with you today. I know that there was a lot of scripture references and a lot of different points that were made. Things that you can go back and maybe um, slow down the video or maybe take notes of certain things and look up these references because I think they'll help you as you learn more about the Trinity. Who is God the Father? Who is God the Son? And who is God the Holy Spirit? What roles do they really have in my life? And why does it matter that they are three persons in one God? And so it's been good to be with you today. I hope you have a great rest of the day and we'll talk to you soon. God bless you. Bye-bye.